So now we've seen suffix trees and we've seen the basic query for suffix trees and we want to expand our repertoire of what we can do with suffix trees. Suffix trees let you do so many things, so many different queries, different kinds of matching queries. And here we're going to introduce one new um, component of the tree that we're going to need in order to answer more sophisticated queries. And since we can't talk about all the different sophisticated queries you can do with a suffix tree, I'm going to try to build toward just one, uh, but one that's pretty foundational. And that once we understand this one, I think we're going to understand a lot of what other queries that also use um, the suffix tree, what they do as well. We're going to have to add, though, one more idea to the suffix tree, which is this idea of suffix links. So I'm going to motivate both the kind of query we want to do and the um, suffix link idea in this video. Okay. So we, of course, already have our basic query, the query that solves the exact matching problem where we walk down from the root according to the characters of our pattern, and then if we want to know where those occurrences are, then we traverse the subtree underneath where we stopped our walk down, and we report the offsets that we see in the leaves. Okay, so in this example, if our query was ABA, we would walk down the tree according to ABA. If we then traverse that subtree, we would discover, you know, these, these two matches, the matches at offsets 0 and 3. Okay. So we've seen that, but what about other problems that deal not with the entire string S, not the question of whether or not the entire string S occurs in the text, but whether substrings of S occur in the text? Okay, so let's see a few examples of what we might mean by this, by this sort of substrings of S type query. So as motivation, I'm going to use the example of, I, I mean, ultimately I'm going to use an example from genomics, but to start with, here's an example that's not from genomics, it's just two stanzas of a Edgar Allan Poe poem, and I just want to show you that it can be enlightening if we are comparing these two stanzas and we want to know what's the same and what's different between these two, right, the one on the top and the one on the bottom, it would be awfully helpful if I could just highlight the substrings of the two that are identical. So for example, if I highlight all the identical substrings here, um, I get what's, what's drawn in red, right? So the red is just the, basically all I've done is I've highlighted the words that are in common between the two. And so as soon as you highlight those red, it throws into contrast the difference between the the, uh, you know, the, the distinction between the similarities and the differences between the two stanzas. So it's a very useful initial thing to do, is to figure out where are the substrings that match between these two strings. So that's a, an example that's in English language, but we need this all the time in genomics, especially when dealing with questions of how to compare two genomic sequences, like two assembled genomes. So for example, I have a picture here that has an excerpt from two different strains of the SARS-CoV-2 genome, and if I just use red to highlight the substrings that are similar, it's going to shed a lot more light on how similar these sequences are than you can get just by staring at this picture. So here I go, there now I've highlighted in red everything that is a substring that's matching between the two, and the black is just the sort of the pieces between those substring matches. Okay, so immediately again, it sort of throws into relief, or makes it clear by contrast, the parts of the genomes that are the same, the parts of the genomes that are different. This is another example of a plot that often is made to compare two genome sequences, sometimes called a dot plot, that's been made with a tool called Mummer. Mummer is a great example of a tool that uses suffix trees, and in fact, Mummer uses the idea that we're building toward as part of its algorithm for comparing two genome sequences. But what you see here is just a, a diagram. It's, a, it's something like a scatter plot where you have to imagine that on one axis I have an excerpt from one genome and on the other axis I have an excerpt from another genome. These happen to be two fun, fungus genomes that are being compared here. And the colored X's in this diagram, some of which are red and some of which are green, correspond to substrings that are in common between the two. So if a substring is in common between the two, we plot a dot for that substring, and its 
uh, position along the horizontal axis is its offset into the first sequence, and its position along the vertical axis is, it, is its offset into the second sequence. So again, it's another way of just quickly figuring out what portions of those genomes are similar. And in genomics, we have this somewhat interesting case where similarities between two genomes might actually be not on the same so-called strand of the DNA, but on opposite strands. Right, so that's, that's why you see red trails that go kind of in one diagonal direction and then green trails that go in the other direction. They correspond to some similarities that are between the same strands on the two genomes versus some similarities that are between opposite strands on the two genomes. Okay, so all of this is to motivate our ability to use the suffix tree to find substring similarities between two strings. So let's see a little bit more about what we mean by that. So take, for example, this text in this query, right? Our usual text, and then new query, ABAB. ABAB, let's just look at the text for the moment, not the tree. Just looking at the text, ABAB does not occur in that text. However, a piece of it does, right? So like ABA, for example, is a long substring of S, a link three substring of S, that does occur in T. But the entire substring, ABAB, the entire string, does not occur in T. Okay, so ABAB does not occur, but a piece of it does. So how would we discover or observe this fact over the course of trying to match the string ABAB using our usual exact matching uh, strategy of walking down from the root. Well, if we walk down from the root, according to ABAB, we would follow this path, ABA. Then the next character on our query is B, but there is no outgoing edge from that node whose label starts with B. So that would be where we would, quote unquote, fall off. The observation to make here is that we know at the point just before we fell off that we found a pretty good match. And we know how long that match is because the length of the match that we've found so far over the course of a walk down is equal to the depth, the label depth, where, to where we are in the tree, right? So by the time we get to this path here, our label depth, which is to say the length of the string that you would get if you concatenated the strings along the edges on the way from the root to where you are, right? So that would just, so that, that concatenated string would be ABA, so we are at label depth three. So that tells us that right before we fell off, we found a substring match of length three. Okay, so just the process of traversing the tree, even though we failed to find a match for the entire query, we of course learned a little something along the way. We learned about a nice long length three substring match between the query and the text, okay? So that's one example where the tree helped us to understand something about a substring match even though the entire string failed to match. Okay, let's look at another example like that. So same text, new string. This string is BBAA. And just like before, let's look first at T and see if BBAA occurs. No, it does not occur. There is, like there was last time, there's a substring in common though, which is BAA, right? BAA occurs in the text T. Okay, so BBAA does not occur, but again, a chunk of it does. Okay, what if we use that same strategy as before, which is to take this query string, walk down from the root, and then see where we fall off and what we learned along the way. Well, that would not be so helpful in this case because we fall off quickly, right? We fall off right after the first B, right? Because as soon as we see the second B, that already is not a substring of T, so we fall off quickly. So if we consider where we fall off in this case, we fall off a little bit too quickly for us to conclude that there is a good long substring match between S and T. So let's try something else instead, or in addition to what we were doing before, which is if we fall off, we hop right back on, but back at the root. We basically start over. So if we fall off here after this B, let's just say our new strategy is that we'll go back to the root and try from there on to match the rest of the characters in S. 
Okay. So in this case, that would mean that we, you know, we've already matched this initial, I'll use blue, we already matched this initial B. Now we're going to move, we're going to go sort of like, whoop, go back to the root and see if we can match the final BAA. And we can, of course, in this case, because that's the substring that's in common. So we can walk down according to BAA. And now we've learned that even though the entire string doesn't have a match with respect to T, there is a nice long link three substring. In fact, it's a suffix of S that does have a match. Okay, so we just had to sort of augment our strategy a little bit so that when we fall off, we don't immediately give up. We sort of keep trying. And in this case, my suggestion for how to keep trying was to start over, start from the root, but then continue to try to match characters from S. Okay, so that's a basic strategy, but it's not going to work perfectly. So let me show you another example where even this strategy that involves starting over is not going to be perfect. Let's take another string, BABA. As usual, like in the last two examples, BABA does not occur in the text T, but a piece of it does, right? So BABA does not occur, but as we can see, ABA does occur. Okay, so if we were to walk down according to the characters of BABA, we would go like this, BA would get us to here, and then we would fall off. Okay, so we learned that there's a length two substring of our query that occurs in the text, BA, but we don't want to give up there. There might be an even longer substring of our query that occurs in the text T, and maybe we want to know that. So let's try this idea of resetting. So resetting means we go back to the root and we just try again from the next character in S. In other words, we say, okay, well, we're done with this prefix. Now I'm going to go back to the root, and now I'm going to try to match the last two characters of S. And we can do that, and they'll match. And there we go. We found another length to match. It's actually the same match we found before, which is the substring BA. However, that's not as good as we could possibly do, right? We could do a little bit better because, of course, the substring ABA also occurs in T. But we missed that, right? This simple strategy of walking down, and then if we fall off, we simply reset ourselves back to the root. That was not quite sophisticated enough to find the longest substring in common between S and T in this case. We need to be even more sophisticated than just this idea of resetting, okay? And the problem with this reset idea is that the reset has no way of carrying over information from the partial match, from, from the match we've seen so far, into the next one. And that's kind of what we needed to have done in this case, right? We, when we went from the first match, which was this first BA, and moved on to the second match, which was the second BA, we kind of drew a line and ignored everything that came before when we started over. However, if we had a way of trying to remember this A, right, the fact that this A was here at the end of our previous match, then that somehow carrying over the information about that partial match into the next step would have given us what we needed. It would have given us the ability to find the length 3 substring, right? In other words, if instead of resetting back to the root, we had reset back to here, right, accounting for the fact that we still have that A on the end of our previous match, then we would have found the length 3 substring ABA. So that's, in essence, what we would like to do. But we need to have this kind of thing in the data structure, these kinds of what you might call shortcuts in the data structure, or we're going to call them suffix links in the data structure. Okay. So that motivates why we want these suffix links. Once we have the suffix links, we will be able to have an algorithm that solves the, you know, that perfectly solves this problem and tells us about the link 3 substring in this case. So to carry over information about partial matches into subsequent steps in the algorithm, we're going to augment the suffix tree with suffix links. I need to define now what do I mean? What's a suffix link? The definition of a suffix link depends on the fact that we have to remember nodes have labels, right? So in this diagram here, for example, I can highlight a couple of these nodes. This node right here has a label in the sense that it, there is a string that is spelled out if we walk to that 
node down from the root. And in the case of this node, that's simply the string BA, right? The label, the label on this one edge that we would have to walk down to get to that node. Okay. In the case of this node down here, it's a B A because those are the labels of the edges concatenated that we would have to walk along in order to get to that node. Okay. So recall that nodes have labels and that's going to be important because our definition of suffix links depends on these node labels. Okay. So what are the suffix links? Well, I'll define them this way. If one node has a label X alpha, when I draw two things next to each other like this, it just means concatenated, right? So when the variables are juxtaposed, it means concatenation of two things. So if one node has the label X alpha, where X is a character and alpha is a string, right? X and alpha are variables. If some node has a label X alpha, where X is a single character and alpha is a string, possibly empty string, and the other node has label alpha without the X on the beginning, then we would draw a special edge from X alpha to alpha, the node that has label X alpha to the node that has label alpha. Okay. All right. So in the picture that you see here, I have suggestively colored some of the edges and their labels so as to represent a potential X and alpha. All right, so in this case, the X is A and the alpha is B A. All right, so the X is A and the alpha is B A in this example. And so what the definition is telling us is that we should draw a suffix link from the node labeled A B A X alpha, which is A B A, to the node labeled B A. So this link, just like this. Okay, so in this case, where alpha equals BA, X equals A, we would draw that link that you see there. And that's a suffix link. That's going to help us with this problem of carrying over partial matches so that we can find good substring matches between two strings. Okay, a couple details about the suffix links. We'll draw them all in in a few moments, but anyway, a few details about them. A suffix link can have a leaf as its source or its sink. No problem. There's no conceptual problem with that. So for example, this node has label A, A, B, A dollar. I'll just write this in here. Maybe I'll write it um, with the appropriate colors. A, A, B, A dollar is the label of this leaf node here. And the label of the other one, I'll use just blue for this, is A, B, A dollar label of this one is just ABA dollar. So again, I would draw a suffix link from the node labeled X alpha to the node labeled alpha. In this case, this uh, pictured purple dotted line is the appropriate edge. Okay, and I just added it onto the picture that has that edge we drew in on the previous slide as well. Right, so there's no reason why we can't have links, suffix links that are outgoing and incoming to leaf nodes. Similarly, there's no reason we can't have suffix links that have the root as their destination, right? This would just be a case where if you consider X alpha and alpha, um, alpha is empty. Alpha is the empty string that can happen. So like in this instance, uh, I drew in this edge here that corresponds to a situation where X is a, the letter a and alpha is the empty string. Okay, that's epsilon for the empty string. Okay, and so this, so you would draw an edge from the node labeled A to the node that has the empty label, which is the root node. So there's no problem with that. We can also have suffix links that point to the root. Okay, given the definition, we can draw them all on this diagram, all of them. So let's do that. It'll get a little cluttered, but let's do it anyway, just to inform ourselves. Okay, so I'll tell you one part that's really kind of intuitive is that the leaves have a sort of chain of suffix links connecting to each other, right? Because take, for example, this uh, leaf, the one labeled zero, and this one, the one labeled one, 
Well, you know that these have a suffix link relationship because this one has label A, B, A, A, B, A dollar, and this one has label B, A, A, B, A dollar, right? So we can say that X is A and alpha is B, A, A, B, A dollar and draw a suffix link. And that'll be true for every successive pair of leaves that have an increasing label. So zero to one, one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five, five to six, and we can even draw in a nice edge here from six back to the root. Okay, so there are those, right? There's sort of a chain of suffix links that goes along all the leaves back to the root, um, quite intuitive. I am now going to, for visual clarity, get rid of all that so that I can draw on the rest of the suffix links. In other words, the ones that relate the internal nodes, the non-leaf nodes. Okay, so let's look, for example, at this node here. This node has label ABA, right? I'll just draw on the labels here. That has label A, that has label BA. All right, so which suffix links do we draw? Well, we can draw this suffix link here, ABA to BA. We can draw this suffix link here, BA to A. Let me make my A a little bit better there. And then we can draw on one more from A to empty. Okay, so there's the picture with all the suffix links in it. We just drew all those. For, um, to be sure, we have not actually uh, increased the size of the data structure in big O terms once we've added all these suffix links. Imagine, we're explicitly representing all these suffix links. It's no worse than the space required to represent the nodes, right? Because there's just one link outgoing per node. So we are still in big O of M budget territory. We're still good on our big O of M budget. The suffix links don't break our budget. They do make the data structure bigger, obviously, because we have to additionally store these links, but they don't make it asymptotically bigger. And one more detail I'll mention before moving on is since the links that are outgoing from the leaves have that kind of predictability to them, that the one from zero goes to the one to one to the, goes to the one to two, it is often, there's often a way to get around having to explicitly represent those in the data structure. And indeed, I'm also going to not explicitly draw them in on the picture just because that's pretty intuitive, right? If you, if you forget, just remember, it's sort of like starting at zero, you go up to one, two, three, right? You can just imagine the right way of drawing in all the suffix links that involve the leaves. It's very predictable. It's a very simple um, function of the labels in those leaves. So I'm going to generally leave them out, assuming that we all sort of understand that they are there. Okay, so these suffix links that we just added to the data structure, which, by the way, as I mentioned before when I discussed Ukonin's algorithm, I mentioned, I mentioned this in passing, but it's important. Ukonin's algorithm both uses suffix links and constructs all of them for you, right? So the output from Ukonin's algorithm is not just a suffix tree, it's a suffix tree with all of these suffix links already there, all right? So you can um, keep them uh, in order to be able to do the kind of query that we're going to see soon, okay? So the suffix links have this basic function of allowing us to take partial matches that we've already found, but allow them to carry over into the next match that we're trying to find so that we can find, in some sense, maximal matches of substrings of the query to the text. So in the coming videos, I'm going to show how to actually use the suffix links to find similar substrings between pattern and text using the idea of matching statistics.